Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. The psalmist brings to mind at the beginning of Psalm 136 two of God's glorious attributes, his goodness and his mercy. God is good to us in that he is merciful to us. We have examined the goodness of God, and now we will take up and examine the mercy of God. He mentions the mercy of God in each of the 26 verses. It's one of the psalms, one of the notable things about this psalm. It makes it song-like, doesn't it? That repetitive, his mercy endureth forever as a refrain or a chorus, using it as a repetitive refrain to remind us over and over again, repetition in the scripture is a device the Holy Spirit uses to draw our attention to an important fact so that we'll never forget that his mercy is great and everlasting. He ends the glorious 23rd Psalm by reminding us, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's mercy and his grace are often joined together. We find each of the pastoral epistles opening with them together in Paul's greeting to the first and second Timothy and Titus. With an apostolic greeting joined with peace, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. John tells us this as well in 2 John 3. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. As we've seen and we often repeat, God in his mercy does not give us what we do deserve which is the eternal separation and in hell. And God in his grace gives us what we don't deserve, his forgiveness, his salvation in heaven. The psalmist in Psalm 136 calls upon us to praise God for his great long-suffering and mercy, and well we should. The Bible tells us that God's mercy is great, Solomon prayed in 1 Kings 3, 6, when he became king, that would be a heady thing, wouldn't it, to have the kingdom handed over to you and following such an illustrious predecessor as David with all of his faults and failures, he was considered the greatest king of Israel. And Solomon prayed, as we should when we are thrust into new opportunities or great responsibilities and situations that are beyond our control and we wonder how we landed there, we should pray as Solomon did. He said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy. And surely he did, did he not, in light of all that we've studied today. According as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness, and that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And you'll remember that Solomon asked for wisdom to do that job instead of anything else he might could have asked. We see that God's mercy, not only is it great, but God's mercy is plenteous. Psalm 86, verse 5, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. I think Spurgeon said that God is more ready to forgive than we are prone to sin. So great is our God in his forgiveness. Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. And so we would tell you tonight, if you need mercy, call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. God's mercy is tender. In Luke 1, verse 78, we read, Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. In 1 Peter 1, verse 3, we learn that God's mercy is abundant. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, it's always more than enough, hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. His mercy is everlasting, as we see here in the psalm before us. And in Psalm 103, verse 17, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting and to everlasting. It is as eternal as He is, as are all of God's attributes. They come with Him. They are part of Him. They're intrinsic to Him. And His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him. No wonder the psalmist says in Psalm 59, verse 16, I will sing of Thy power, yea, I will 
sing aloud of the mercy, thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and my refuge in the day of trouble. We might ask then, what is the difference between God's grace and his mercy? As we've mentioned, for one thing, God's mercy flows from his grace. In fact, all of the attributes of God are joined together like links in a chain or they're pictured as flowing into one another and supporting one another and complementing one another. God's goodness speaks of his rich store of good things, pressed down and shaken together and running over. He gives goodness and good things lavishly to his creatures. We look around us, we sang that opening hymn, that beautiful hymn that if I survey the ground I tread or wherever I look, there's nowhere we can go that you're not there. Wherever we look, whatever we see <clears throat> has the fingerprints of God upon it. And we see it so uh, amazing in, in providing for his creatures. We look around us and see that he's made all of creation to cater to the needs of even and even the wants of his creatures. God's goodness also speaks of his freeness and his willingness to show his mercy. God is more willing, as I've mentioned, to forgive than we are to sin. And we are very prone to sin. So that tells us how wonderful our God's mercy is. He is quick and ready to relieve us of the burden and the effects of our sin as every born-again person, converted person can testify. This is grounds then, is it not, church, for us to sing about and to praise and to extol his name. The assurance by which David pleads for forgiveness in Psalm 51 when he comes to him, he asks God to wash him, purge him, cleanse him, all those things. How? According or why? According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. On the ground of your mercy, we said this morning, that's the only basis that David could, could come to the Lord. There was no other ground but to plead to God's mercy. There was no sacrifice he could bring. There was no, no other thing that he could plead except throw himself upon the mercy of God. God's mercy comes first before our sin. And while we should not presume upon it and take it for granted, never forget God's willingness to show mercy. It was already in motion before Adam and Eve ever sinned. We see in creation all around us that there is what we would refer to as God's general mercy, not unlike his common grace. Everyone on earth experienced it to some degree. The, the mercy is shown to the lost as well as to the saved. We were in desperate need of rain. Our Lord supplied it. It didn't just rain on saved people's crops and yards. It rained on the lost as well. All of creation benefits from God's general mercy. Psalm 145 verse 9, His tender mercies are over all His works. Acts 17 25, He giveth to all life and breath and all things. The hymn writer writes, To all life thou givest, to both great and small. In all life thou livest, the true life of all. Thy wisdom so boundless, thy mercy so free, eternal thy goodness, for naught changeth thee. God provides for the animals. He provides for all of his creation, including fallen, sinful man. One of the sad things about the lost around us is they have no concept that they're in great debt to the mercy of God. Matthew 5, verse 45, our Lord reminds us all, He maketh His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. There is a special or sovereign mercy showered on those who are saved, given to us through the gracious work of our Savior on our behalf. And to be sure, the general mercy that the unsaved presently enjoy, and to the extent that they do, is only for this life. We might call it a temporary mercy. And they certainly enjoy it. They benefit from all of the blessings that we all benefit as well. But once the lost pass into eternity, they will never know any of God's mercy. In fact, one of the definitions of hell is, it a, is a place devoid of anything good or tender or merciful. You remember how the Lord himself gave the, the story of the rich man who died and went to hell. And he pled for just a drop of water. 
And he, he was unrelenting in his thirst and his pain and his agony. And yet God's mercies do not go to the lost in hell. Theirs is a temporal mercy while they're here. And though ignorant of it, they are the rich recipients of it. Ours as the saved is an eternal mercy. In, Psalm, in Isaiah 27, verse 11, speaking of the lost, Therefore he that made them will not have mercy on them. Speaking of that day, that moment when they pass into eternity. And he that formed them will show them no favor. Which is another word in the Old Testament of God's mercy, his favor. It is equally sure that all of God's attributes are eternal. They're never changing. Never lessening in their power, intensity, or their duration. Psalm 116, verse 5, Gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. Intrinsically, in and of himself, is part of his being. The objects of his mercy and the exercise of his mercy, who he shows mercy to, is controlled by his own will, his own good pleasure. As one has noted, this must be so, for there is nothing outside himself which obliges him to act in mercy toward us. If it were, that would be something that something would be supreme and God would cease to be God. It is God's grace, then his mercy that determines the exercise. God's grace determines his exercise of his mercy. He declares in Romans nine, verse 15, he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Again, quoting the commentator, it is not the wretchedness of the creature which causes him to show mercy. For God is not influenced by things outside of himself as we are. Still less is it the merits of the creature which causes him to bestow mercies upon them, for it is a contradiction in terms to speak of meriting mercy. It is impossible. Titus 3 verse 5 tells us that, doesn't it? Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but what? According to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration, our works did not impress God, could not impress God before or after salvation. And so they certainly could, commend, could not commend us or get his attention or cause him to show favor toward us, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. There are no such things. There are no righteous works apart from the righteous work of Christ imputed on our behalf in enabling us to serve him. It is the person work of Jesus Christ, the Savior, his great worth that is the basis of God, the righteous judge, not judging us to the degree that he could and should. But he looks to the, the work of his son to lavish spiritual mercies on the saved because his justice has been satisfied. His justice is not put on hold or not made important. His justice and his holiness, his perfection does not cease to be because of our great need or wretchedness. That debt must be paid. And it was paid by the sinless life and the perfect work of Christ at Calvary. Fully propitiating, fully, fully, fully atoning, fully satisfying our debt to the holiness and perfection of God. We must remember that none of God's attributes override the others. And it seems almost as modern day evangelicalism or whatever you want to call, emphasize some of God's attributes without looking at the whole. And that's an improper warped view of God. As we examine the attributes of God as a giant faceted gemstone, an emerald or a diamond, each facet perfectly is the same as the other. No one facet is bigger or overshadows the other. And so no, no, not one of God's attributes override or counts, cancels out the other. All of God's perfections stand in perfect balance to each other. We are not that way. We're not balanced. We have problems. We're, we're warped. Not only are we sinners, we have proclivity to sin. We are not perfectly balanced people. All of us, if we were to examine our, ourselves and let everybody see it, which would be a horrible thing to do, we'd say, my, you've got, you've got an issue about that over there. And sometimes, do you ever just stop and say, why did I just do that? You know, what, why, did, why did I? And I'm not going to go any farther than that because then you'll begin to think, well, our pastor is really strange. But we're not perfectly balanced. We love partially, don't we? You know, we love those who love us. We love our children, and we, 
my mother used to say, you know, she, my, my mother was something else, and she'd say, my children don't have any faults. If they did, I would see them. I would know that they had faults. She said it tongue-in-cheek because we were horrible, and, and she knew it. But that, that's the way we are. We don't see things perfectly, do we? We don't see our own sin perfectly. And so, but God is in absolute contrast to us in his perfections. We will enjoy God's mercy and its effects forever. It's an, it will be an ongoing enjoyment. We read in Revelation 21, verse 27, of the new Jerusalem, there shall be no, in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither worketh abomination. Part of what will be, make heaven heaven is not the streets of gold, or the walls of jasper, and so on and so forth, which almost people always obsess over, you know, the peripheral things. But what not will be there, pain and agony, sickness, and anything that causes the heart to tremble or, or to harm us, there will be nothing that defileth. Where can you go except to heaven where the, something is not there that could defile? Neither worketh abomination. It would not be merciful of God. And I, I, I put this, you may not have thought it this way. It is merciful of God to punish the lost eternally because it would not be merciful of God if the saved had to put up with the blasphemous and abominations of the lost eternally. We have to, all of our earthly pilgrimage, our righteous soul as lots is, are, are, are vexed by those who curse our God and call upon his name in, in cursing and who defame and debauch the, the, the holy things. And if, if they were to allow to live perpetually, it would, it would be injurious to the saved to have to put up with that. But God in his mercy deals with it as he does. David prayed in Psalm 143, verse 12, and of thy mercy cut off mine enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. And obviously these that were afflicting him were trying to thwart him in his work for the Lord. Psalm 136 verse 15 tells us that the judgment of Pharaoh and his armies was a mercy. God overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the sea for his mercy endureth forever. We just read that. It was, not, it was an act of, of, of vengeance upon uh, Pharaoh and his host to be sure. Pharaoh high-handedly and with full knowledge and, 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 and undeniable proofs that there was a God in heaven. Remember what his response was? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I have no concern about it. I don't want to care about him. I don't have anything. I don't answer to him. And God showed him in an unmistakable way. Yes, you do. And still he didn't repent. He didn't, he didn't bow his knee to the, to the lordship of, of the Lord. It was an act of mercy unto the Israelites for him to bring, bring judgment upon Pharaoh Again, in Revelation 19, we read, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power and unto the Lord our God for true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again, they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. All of that is part of God's great mercy. Unbelievably, the lost, while they may not admit it, they expect God's mercy toward them, or at least they presume upon it. In fact, they can't imagine him ever doing anything but showing mercy to them. And when you engage in conversation to try to show people their need for the Savior, the need for salvation, they will almost always say, I don't believe there's a God in heaven that would send someone to hell or cause his son to have to die on the cross. And so they presumptuously presume on a mercy that is not a Bible mercy whatsoever. They don't expect to have to answer for their sins against him. When the Bible very clearly says they will have to answer for every idle word spoken. They have a mercy that says that God will overlook what he's proclaimed to be true. And that he'll put it on hold or make it of none effect. Just for them. Just because they're so special. They don't expect to have to answer for their sins against him. Not realizing that they will give an account. They presume there is no hell. They just excuse it. It's unthinkable to them. It's unpalatable to them. And so it must not be. 
And so they presume and say, oh, the God is not that kind of God. They begin to define and make a God of their own creation. Romans 1, for when they, God revealed himself to them, they glorified him not as God, but set about to establish their own view of God. And we have it to this very day. Or they don't think that God would ever send them to a hell if there is one. They might for a hatchet, he might send it for a hatchet murderer or a really bad person, a bigot or whatever the horriblest thing you could say about somebody, but not me, I'm a good person. They presume that the Bible really doesn't mean what it says. This, presu- this is presuming on God's mercy. They think that if there is a God, he is too merciful to do any of those things that his word has said he will do. They forget even as many professing believers do, that all of God's attributes, again, are balanced. None overshadow the other. It appears that his mercy is prominent or that his love covers all. If it does appear that way, it's perfectly due to the holy justice of God that's been satisfied fully by the work of our Savior. In Exodus 24, verse 7, he declares there, he says he will, he will by no means clear the guilty. In other words, unless the satisfaction of their debt to him be paid. Psalm 9, verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. A.W. Pink writes, as well might men reason thus, I do not believe that if filth be allowed to accumulate and sewage become stagnant and people deprive themselves of fresh air, that a merciful God will not let them fall into a prey to a deadly fever. The fact is that those who neglect the laws of health are carried away by disease, notwithstanding God's mercy. Equally true is that those who neglect the laws of spiritual health shall forever experience and endure the second death. To those who despise God's word, who ignore and purposefully or ignorantly violate it, God will meet them where they are. That is, recompense them accordingly. In Luke chapter 13, you'll remember some people came to the Lord Jesus one day. There had been some recent events that were troubling and in, even in the Jewish mindset of our Lord's day, there was always a cause and effect. If a person was blind, they, you remember they asked their, the Lord, which one of his parents sinned that he was born blind? And Jesus had to correct that. There was always this cause and effect. If there was a disability, if there was a deformity, if there was a situation, it was always, they felt, you remember Job's friends, they came and just, just picked him apart and said, there's something, you're just not admitting it. And that was the mindset. Anything bad that happened was a direct cause of something that that person did or their, their parents did. And you'll remember, they said they were present at that, that season, some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He had slaughtered some people who'd come to bring sacrifices and their blood mingled with the sacrifices they were offering at the temple. And Jesus answered, they came and told him about it as if, well, what about that? How could that happen? How could a God in heaven allow people to be coming to church and give their, you know, their tithe and be gunned down? What kind of God is that? You can imagine the scenario. And so they brought that. It was on the news. They were current in their mind. Remember, we just heard a few days ago or a while ago, these people came to the temple. They were offering their sacrifices and Pilate slaughtered them. How can that be? And what, you remember what Jesus' response was? This is Jesus' response to tragedies. People will often say, how could a God of mercy, how could a God of, of love allow these things to take place? And Jesus' answer to them was this. Do you suppose that those Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? And they did. They thought that if that happened, they were really bad people, even if they were at church. There was something in their lives that caused God to do that. You know what his, his response was? I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And at first we say, what an answer, what a response. They gave him another one. Or those, he brought it up, those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, this tower just fell and killed 18 people. And again, they wondered whose sin and what kind of sin, what kind of people they were that that had happened to. Think, do you think they were sinners above all the men that dwelt in Jerusalem just because that happened to them? I tell you, no. But 
Except you repent, you shall likewise perish. The bottom line is there's no good people. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no one who's not worthy of a tower falling on them or being slain or having cancer or whatever horrible thing you want to think of. We live in a fallen world that was set in motion by the, the, the determined uh, decision of Adam and Eve to sin and have wreaked havoc to this very day. We're under the fallenness of Adam and Eve. The point is not how you die. The point is you're going to die. A tower may fall on you, or you may die of cancer, or you may die of old age, but this we know it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. That's what you need to think about, not why a tower fell, or why a plane crashed, or why Pilate slew these people with their sacrifices. That's hard. He didn't say that wasn't bad or shouldn't have happened, but those kind of things happen in a world where sin reigns. And he said you need to concentrate on the eternal and the spiritual and your own soul, unless you repent yourself. You're going to die, and then what? God is merciful toward his people, the saved. Not just in salvation, but a continued mercy toward us. In Psalm 57, verse 10, thy mercy is great unto the heavens. That's like telling a little child telling their parent, I love you, to the moon and back. God's greatest mercy, if you were to, his mercy is so great, you could measure it all the way to heaven if you could do such a thing. Psalm 103, verse 11, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. It cannot be measured. So great is his mercy. By his mercy, he quickened us. And child of God, the, most, the thing we should be most thankful for as we ponder this glorious attribute of our Lord, it was that his mercy that regenerated you and brought you to where you are just now. Ephesians 2 verse 4 tells us, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. 1 Peter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us, regenerated us, quickened us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We praise God, don't we, for His everlasting mercy. We praise Him for it, and may we be faithful in giving out the glorious gospel and telling others of His mercy so that they may learn of this great, great mercy. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. That lasts a long time, doesn't it? Gracious Lord, we thank You for these truths that we've heard today. We pray, Lord, that you would help us as the saved to ponder them afresh and anew and to love you and to serve you and to be merciful and gracious toward others because you've showed us great mercy. Lord, help us to be patient with the lost around us. This is all of heaven they're going to know about. Your mercy will end when their heart ends and ceases to beat. And so I pray that we would look through your eyes and look through eternal eyes uh, as we look and minister and, and, and do business with t people day by day. And may we do good to all men, but especially to those of the household of faith. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.